Frank, Thomas, and Kirby entered the office break room at approximately 12.25 on a Tuesday afternoon. Each man holds various containers designed for holding food and drink, and as they lazily slump into the fiberglass chairs that were haphazardly pushed under the table at their previous uses, the room echoes the violence flops, wops, and elongated pops as the Tupperware lids fly open and Velcro bags release their treasures. God damn it! Thomas rolled his eyes. Frank, with a mouthful of pizza, mumbles with empathy. Um, wife back your tuna salad again, huh? Thomas tosses the eggy, soggy sandwich down onto the table with a rejigilant glop. She knows I hate this stuff. I swear I've reached my breaking point with this shit. <laughs> Why don't you just pack your own lunch? Kirby attempts to speak. Through his teeth cracked at salad, a drop of ranch dressing falls from his lip and collides at the table. Thomas just simply glares at Kirby in disdain. You don't get it. I've told her like 50 times that I absolutely loathe tuna salad. But does she listen? No, she doesn't. Thomas raises his hand, right hand to his forehead. I swear I've had it up to here with this. Well, at least not like that one guy. Frank wipes his mouth with the residual wipes his mouth of residual pepperoni grease of a cheap paper napkin. Uh wait. What guy? Thomas looks at Frank with slight confusion. Hey, are you talking about that guy from CompuTools? Yeah, I heard about him on the news last week. Kirby chimes in. He's already begun digging into his pudding cup. Thomas spins around to Kirby. Hey, what in the hell are you guys talking about? Frank wipes off his hands with another paper napkin and simply folds his hands in front of him, leans in quietly. Thomas and Kirby simply follow suit. You see, there was a guy over at CompuTools, a nice guy from what I hear. Now, what was his name again? Frank continued to concentrate at the ceiling in search for the name. Then suddenly, Frank snaps his fingers. Bill Kirbingson. Anyway, he was one of those diligent workers that never complained, always got his work done before deadline, and hell, he would even stay up late to make sure that his perfect record was never tarnished. Thomas chimed in. God damn it, I hate those kind of guys. Well, supposedly someone at CompuTools hired this new hotshot manager. Basic ROTC, messed up at corporate, you know? Never lifted a finger in his life and got the skip right to the front. Thomas shook his head. Exactly. So this guy was brought into, Frank raised a finger in quotations, help, and since this douche didn't really know anything about CompuTools products, he would just spark orders and micromanage everyone. Everyone in the office is buzzing, we're gonna quit, let's get HR involved, this guy's completely heartless. The usual empty water cooler promises everyone was in a tiff. Except for Phil. Phil wouldn't, would just mind his own business and do his work with a silent smile. And he would even go as far as asking the new manager, anything I can do to help? Well, I don't know that if this manager deliberately planned this maliciousness, or if it was just common nature for him. But he got this notion in his head to see how far it could bend Phil until he broke. Starting the very next day, the manager threw the biggest workflow onto Phil's desk and barked out, I need this done by 5 o'clock today or you can just pack your shit now. Or something to that effect. Phil quietly turned to face the manager. His smile, quiet, calm, his innocent smile, and said, Sure thing, boss. 5 o'clock rolls around, and Phil walks into the manager's office and proudly places the completed reports onto the man's desk and says, here you go, boss. The manager looked up from polishing and buffering his prized 600-pound marble desk to the completed pile of papers with a look of complete shock. How could one man complete that report in only seven and a half short hours? His eyes shifted from the report to glare viciously upon Phil's calm, lucid face. Anything else I can do to help? smiled Phil. The manager simply looked in shock and shaked his head in disbelief. Okay, well, I'm gonna head out for the day, sir. You have yourself a great evening. The manager was flabbergasted. He stelled his motives and vowed that he would try harder to break this man's spirit by the end of the week. Well, 
The end of the week came and went, and still Phil was cheerful as ever, always responding to every outrageous task with a happy, sure thing, and turning in the completed work to the manager at the end of the day with a pleasant, anything else I can do to help. Well, this went on for a few weeks, and the manager was now seeing that his current efforts were fruitless, and now, he decided that maybe he needed to work up the ante. The manager was now bombarding Phil with major accounts and lengthy business trips and tedious conference calls, all to quell his passion that Phil must be broken. But with every new and more difficult task, Phil would embrace it with a sure thing boss and come back with a more sunny disposition than before. Anything else I can do to help? The manager was now at wit's end, and had one last trick up its sleeve. Although, his lack of concentration on the job he was hired for is becoming under fire, he wanted to give it one last ditch effort before he himself had to face a firing squad. He got in his head that it was in his breaks, in between each hour of each day that was allowing Phil to wind down and regain his bearings. He got a good night's sleep and came into bed the next day, ready for more. So, with that in mind, he gave Phil the budget report for the following year and told him, I don't care how long it takes, but you can't leave your desk until we trim at least $5 million off next year's budget. As always, Phil replied with his trade mark, Sure thing, boss! And the manager turned away knowing that this task would be Phil's breaking point. And like clockwork, Phil came into the manager's office with the completed budget report and handed it in to him. Anything else I can do to help? The manager looked over the budget. Uh, I don't really like these numbers. The manager threw the report right back at Phil. Do it over, and this time, do it right. Phil's smile smudged a little, but soon rebounded and turned around and headed back to his desk. The manager saw Phil smile buckle for just a moment, and he chuckled to himself knowing that his plan was finally working. 8 o'clock rolls around, and Phil returns back to the manager's office, but Phil looks a little bit different. His hair's a bit disheveled, his horn-rimmed glasses are now on his forehead, one quarter of his shirt has become untucked from his pants. Phil's stride isn't as carefully as before, but Phil hands in the report to the manager all the same and exasperatedly un utters, Anything else I can do to help, sir? The manager is now seeing this victory close at hand and looks at the report. Uh, Phil. <laughs> it looks like you made some miscalculations here. The manager's hands report. The manager hands the report right back to Phil. Do it again. And remember what I said. You cannot leave until this is completed. Phil, dejected. Defeated and disappointed, looks at the report in his hands and wiped the sweat from his brow and scratched the back of his neck. The nearly broken man headed back to his desk to correct the errors. As soon as Phil left his office, the manager could close the door and he danced his twisted, sadistic victory dance. Phil was nearly gone. The manager was going to get some sleep tonight. At 11 o'clock, Phil trudged right back into the manager's office and handed him the completed, corrected, report. Exhausted, Phil asked, Is there anything else I can do to help, sir? The manager, now a shining example of pure arrogance, threw the report right back on the floor and exclaimed, Why did you do the budget report for next year? I asked you to do the budget report for this year. Can't you even follow simple instructions? I want you to march right back to your pathetic little cube and you're gonna stay there all night until you have done exactly what I asked you to do or so God help me I'll find someone else who can do it. Now, no one knows exactly what happened next, but some of the late night stragglers who heard the manager's triad claimed that as soon as he was finished, Phil took off his glasses, cleaned them with the corner of his shirt that was still untucked, put his glasses right back on and closed the blinds in the manager's office. That faced the rest of the room. What came from the room after that was a thunderous crash and a high-pitched shriek. The door flew open and the manager bolted out, glass shards in his hair and bleeding profusely from the place. Call security! Call security! Witnesses then claimed that they saw Phil calmly walk out of the office. Expression was lost to, well, visions of one person can only describe as berserk. Phil's brow was now feared, and 
scrunching his eyebrows into wide arches. His teeth gnarled and, according to one person, appeared to be sharp and pointed. His skin, once pale and fair, was now red and scaly. His slick hair now flailed wildly and his head danced on his own accord. Phil marched towards the cowardly manager. Sure thing! Sure thing! Sure fucking thing! And Phil continued to chant those two words over and over. The volume of his voice continued to climb until he was shrieking. Phil destroyed everything in his path to get to the manager, who was now scrambling for the elevator. He turned over to cubicle, cubicle walls, hurled over the office printer, overturned desk that was still marching at a steady pace. Not once did Phil's gait increase in speed. The elevator doors finally opened. The manager quickly darted inside, and he was frantically pounding on the do do closed door button. Phil's arm thrusted inside the cabin as the doors were closing. The manager let out a gnarlish cry for help, and then... Thomas was now sitting at the edge of his seat, and blinked. Yeah? Well? Frank continued. The security hauled him away, the folks stuck around for a while for the whole ordeal, and say they've never heard Phil use any profanity ever, but on that day, they've heard more curse words that were so vile they almost sound like they are coming from some sort of ancient tongue or some demonic language. Only be the grace of God was the security able to restrain Phil as a paddy wagon rolled up onto the office building street. Witnesses noticed three things. First. That Phil was kicking and screaming the entire time, and he was hardly recognizable. Second, the manager couldn't stop crying, and thirdly, and the most bizarre, they realized what made the thunders crash in the manager's office. <gasps> the 600 pound marble desk, the manager's prized possession, now lay in pieces outside of the office window. So, wait, what? That's it? What happened after that? And there had to been a trial, Thomas exclaimed. Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course there's a trial, but Phil was deemed mentally unstable to serve the trial, so he was committed to the state hospital over in Brookfield, and everything died down and returned to normal. The manager was brought in to see corporate, and he was eventually let go because not only did security cameras record what Phil did to the manager in the office, but they also recorded the manager's outburst on Phil and what caused him to snap in the first place. Just as earth as I would say, Thomas commented, and Kirby just shook his head and started to clean the empty containers. Ha <laughs> ha, well, here's the real punchline. I got from Sally Boyad over at Compu Tools. He used to be a manager admin after the manager was let go. He was cleaning out his temporary desk, and to pass the time, he had the radio turned on, and the manager left his office for a moment to get some more boxes. And as he returned back from his office, she had heard on the radio announce Phil Kerberson has been committed to Brookfield State Hospital on Monday, and was discovered missing from his cell earlier. The manager froze in horror, and as Sally turned around to see the manager's expression, the door violently slammed her face, knocking her backwards onto the ground. As she recovered from her fall, she told me that she could clearly hear the manager pleading for his life. She distinctly heard a please don't, please don't do anything, I'll do anything what you want. And then, a familiar calm, soothing voice came from behind the door. Anything I can do to help? Sally pounced on the door, but it was locked. She tried to look through the window, but the blinds were mostly drawn, so she couldn't really see anything but flailing arms and legs. Sally kicked the door repeatedly and shouted, somebody please help, but it was too late. As the commotion ceased from inside the office, Sally heard the knob click to a single thing had been unlocked. With tears in her eyes, she slowly reached for the knob and opened the door to reveal a <laughs> rather gruesome scene. The manager splayed open from his throat to his pelvis, ribcage and organs exposed, hands twisted into contorted knots of flesh and knuckles, his face wrapped, it warped into an expression of unrelenting anguish and fear, his eyes wide, his jaw locked, nose broken and twisted, and to his left hand. Its last cadence drawing to a close was the manager's own heart, Sally, and some onlookers who finally gained access to the room looked up to see the following message drawn on the wall in a barely dingy yellow office. <laughs> we were wrong. He had an heart after all.
<laughs> Goodbye. Jesus! Thomas had to hold back the vomit and covering his mouth. After that, CompuTool shut down that office. I think they turned into like a mega buy. Frank finished his tale with a Solomon sip of coffee. Thomas rubbed his eyes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Whatever happened to Phil? That's, um, <laughs> that is when I was supposed to say, that's a strange thing, but... It's not really that strange. When they finally opened up the office, the only person that was in there was the manager. Sally even said that she never even actually saw Phil. The only thing that she heard was his voice. Or, at least, what sounded like his voice. And then, and he hasn't been there, like, really ever since. <laughs> that story is completely bullshit, Kirby exclaimed. Frank and Thomas spun around and glared at Kirby for breaking the mood. Uh, what? Thomas inquired, like, you know what exactly happened. I know that that's not what happened, Kirby exclaimed again, as he stated as he adjusted his horn rim glasses. Okay, hotshot, how do you know, Frank jested. Because. <laughs> Kirby leaned in close. Frank and Thomas watched Kirby's movement. The hospital doesn't know I'm gone yet. <laughs> Just then, Kirby's manager leans into the break room. Hey, Kirby, need you to do something for me. Sure thing, boss. As Kirby stands up and leaves the now still break room, Frank and Thomas glance down at Kirby's security badge. The CS full name is Kirby Phillips.